everybody for the second session. Uh, so this is uh, the Ohio Ports Network overview and uh, this presentation is going to be covering the design, build, and purpose behind the ODOT Ports and VRS network from its beginning in the late 90s to modern day. <laughs> um, so your uh, presenter today is uh, Dave Fighter. Uh, Dave is the Ports and VRS manager with the Office of CAD and Mapping Services, formerly known as the Office of Aerial Engineering. At, at the Ohio Department of Transportation. He has worked for ODOT for 20 years. Uh, during his time with the department, Dave was and still is instrumental in the system design, construction, data management, and maintenance of the Ohio Corps VRS network. And Dave has helped the ODOT system grow from its infancy to its current status as the most accessed VRS network in the world. Dave is a graduate of Ohio University where he, where he earned two bachelor's degrees one in civil engineering and the other in manufacturing engineering. Dave is a licensed and professional engineer as well as a surveyor in training. He is a resident of Fairfield County where he lives with his wife Teresa and three kids, Jonathan, Benjamin, and Rosemary. Let's hear it for Dave. Thank you, sir. I think well, he basically covered the intro there pretty well, so we'll just kind of get into this. How many of you guys in this room have ever heard the statement, can't shut the network down when course is up? Okay. You hear that? You hear that good bet. Well, this, I was asked in the presentation to kind of give you guys a little background of what exactly it is, you know, and how we use it and how it's instrumental to the state and, you know, the benefits and stuff along that lines. All right, first we'll get, to, uh, get into the, the acronyms. Uh, CORE stands for Continually Operating Reference Station. It is a GPS receiver that sits on a pedestal or a mount, antenna mount somewhere, running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, VRS, that is the software, actually the package that we're using, it stays for virtual reference system. Like Mike said, the, the core got to start back in 19, in late 90s. Um, I started with it about 98, of course. The core is just kind of getting started at that point. At, you know, at that point, we just had GPS receivers mounted on power poles, uh, metal towers, tops of uh, rickety buildings, and actually during the day we could actually see the GPS receivers move. Um, on several power poles we could actually watch the thing track the sun, because you could see the, the power pole is going to bend when the sun heats it up, heats it up. So in the 2000s, in April 2000 there, we went to an NGS meeting. NGS is the National Geodetic Survey. It's a group of engineers, geophysicists, and surveyors in Washington, D.C. that they kind of uh, kind of manage and warehouse all the uh, precise surveying data for the United States. Um, and that, at that meeting we found out, that convocation, that they were spacing out all the old styles of surveying, you know, the total stations, levels, that stuff was all kind of pushed aside, and all horizontal positioning was going to be done off GPS. And they, they were the ones that kind of come up with this, the newer idea of how to build the cores and how to set the systems up. At that point, you know, our office administrator was John Ray, we had Dave Albrecht, our survey manager at that time. Um, we sat down and kind of put together a plan to see what we could do for ODOT as far as to build a state of system that would meet them criteria. The criteria we put forth, we wanted that to be uniform. Like I said, we had some on power poles, you know, some on steel towers, some on buildings. We wanted everything to be kind of uniform. We wanted to get down to at least one or two maybe different type of designs. Definitely wanted stability because, you know, the type of accuracy we were looking for, you needed everything to be stable. G GNSS signal quality. Um, there's stuff called multi-path and different you know, interference with GPS signals that we wanted to kind of mitigate. Because multi-path is when the GPS signal gets bounced off of something before it hits the GPS antenna. And that will actually cause a little shift in variation in the positional accuracy. Emergency power, you know, that's a given. Lightning protection, you know, we wanted to make sure everything was as safe and secure as possible because these receivers aren't cheap. You know, back when we started this set system, a GPS receiver and antenna was close to $30,000. Now we're getting down to around ten to twelve thousand for an antenna and receiver of actually a better quality. <clears throat> Vandal resistant, same day, same reason. They see that thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment, they're going to touch a swipe. Single point of control, you know, we want to keep everything in house. You know, network connections, you know, make sure we have a good solid connection to the ODOT network, you know, to connect to you guys. Environmental factors, we want to kind of make the stuff look nice, look, you know, kind of fit in with the atmosphere, and easy to maintain. So this is our original monument design we came up with. It's a eight foot tall concrete monument, continually reinforced. Um, and we went anywhere from 12 to 15 feet in the ground with a three foot diameter drill shaft. 
use class S bridge grade concrete and you know the forms and everything else we build it in house, like I said. That was what we called our, our original course classic. Later that year, we uh, installed 10 of these in the, in the state. You know, the first one we did was over to Sydney, you know, Columbus, and then kind of worked our way around from there. After that, we kind of, that, oh, those were all based at 100 kilometers basin. Because back at that point in 2000, there was no such thing as RTK surveying, which is real time kinematic, which I'll get into later. Everything was static post process. So, in other words, you'd set, you'd set survey crews out, they would sit there and sit on a single point for anywhere up to four hours to get good position. Nowadays, we got it down that we can get a good accurate position within about four or five seconds. So, 100 kilometers was kind of the baseline we were looking at that point. And then in 2001, we kind of filled in the gaps a little bit longer, a little bit closer, because the shorter baseline you get, the shorter period of time you have to sit on, a, sit on that mark. So 100 kilometers, you were four hours sitting there, you drop it down, these were about uh, 75 kilometers right? radius, you could drop it down and be three hours, just kind of save a little bit of time in the field because your baseline. After that, about 2002, uh, a company called Tremble, you guys probably all, all heard us cussing, that cussing that name before, but Tremble, a prominent survey equipment manufacturer, approached us and looked at our network and they said, hey, we've got this new product called BRS. You know, with, bit, with what you guys have got in Ohio, we would like to do a beta, beta test and make a test area in the state to test our new software out. We chose the area kind of over there west of Columbus just because of, you know, how the proximity of our office and, you know, that's a flatland area. You know, the farmers are in that area. A lot of survey firms are in that area too. So we added in four more other stations. They're there in red. We called those our course lights. We did not name it that way. You'll see, you'll see why we named it here in a little bit. Actually, it's not, we didn't build a big concrete monument, we built a building now. Picked out some masonry structures over there, bolted the stuff on the side of the building there. And we made, called, that's our pilot area for our BRS. We ran that for about a year, a year and a half, did a lot of testing. Currently, this is what we got in the state. There are 61 stations, not, that also counting the ones that we're sharing data with, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, West Virginia. But this is our current map that we've got. And there's a, there is a, this station, Jaga County, is in planning right now because we're working with Jaga County Engineer to try to get that one up and running. Jaga County is going to buy the equipment. We're going to go over and build the station <coughs> and add it onto the network. The network was constructed. We did everything in house. You know, we did not use HTs from the district to go build this, we did not hire consultants to do this. Everything was built in house. John Ray, if any of you knew him, kind of a little bit of a control guy. Everything we wanted to keep everything within our office. You know, we see the benefits of this. We could control our own quality. You know, we could have a little bit of flexibility on design, and we knew what we had, so we knew how to fix it. And the fact we could go out, and mobilize real quick, go out and do the job and get it done. We didn't have to mess around with bidding and you know send out the specs or whatever for that. And the first, the second one there came into play on our first build. This is Sydney. This is an example of the design flexibility. As you can see, as we pour concrete in this form, the forms start coming apart. We learned real quick, do not use the class S concrete with super plasticizer in it, which made this made it very, very fluid. As soon as they hit it with the concrete vibrator up there, the form started coming apart. You know, we're sitting there wrapping uh, ratchet binders and chain binders around it to keep the thing together. If you drive by the uh, Shelby County garage area in Sydney, Look at that core station, it comes down, kind of bulges out, and it kind of comes down. We kind of nicknamed that the pregnant core station <laughs> because of what, what happened. We did save it, but like I said, you know, it went back to the designing board real quick, like on that Ford, because that three quarter inch plywood, the way we had the corners designed, did not hold the, pre the hydrostatic pressure. Before each station is built, we go out <coughs> and we set a uh, uh, tripod up put a, at eight foot. Set chokering and tan on top of it, let it cook for about a week. You know, we do this to ensure that the data quality is good. And I know a lot of you are sitting back looking, okay, there's 138,000 volt power lines sitting right there behind that station, and we've heard electric, electrical, elect, bleh, electric lines uh, cause interference with GPS. Not necessarily. The issues with the electrical lines and GPS are all due to broken insulators. If an insulator on that, that has a crack in it, that makes the noise, makes the buzz, which is actually cut through the GPS signal. So at that site there in Wayne County, that's a Wayne County garage. 
But that's like, you know, that was good clean data. And when we submitted that site to NGS for acceptance, we kind of took pictures so there was a PowerPoint in the background. But, you know, that's what it, how we started out. Every project we started out, we'd go out and set this receiver up and let it cook for a week and then run the data through some specialized programs to test the clarity of the data. You know, we've got the geotech uh, section in, at ODOT. Right after we check and make sure the site's good, we have to send them guys out. Every site, we get a core, core sample down to 100 feet approximately to make sure the soil's stable underneath and there's no underground mine shafts, et cetera. You know, there's the same example of the core, the core that was taken at the South Pass Island. So, you know, we're, we're continually making sure that everything, the quality is good when we come from the get-go. This is up at the Marion County garage. This just shows the uh, auger that we had. This is actually a specially made auger to dig that deep. They actually took a tree auger that they did for planting trees, a three foot diameter tree auger, built some specialized extensions out to get it down to the 12 to 15 feet deep. And the normal auger truck won't spin that. So they've got this, that's the District 7. There. District 7 and District 3 are the two districts that have the big, powerful auger trucks that actually can, that can spin that auger. So we have the guys come out from that district to, to shoot the holes down for us. Like I said, everything's continually reinforced. This is at Marion as well. Uh, there are the four number five rebars there, five eighths inch diameter uh, rebars with rebar rings in them. The centerpiece of conduit is what we run our antenna cable in. Most of the uh, stations right now are running LMR 400 coaxial cable. Some of the longer runs are LMR 600 or the LDF 450. Uh, we keep everything kind of like I said, keep everything inside. You know, it's inside the concrete monument, so it's protected from people with weed eaters, people, guys with batwing mowers that move too close to it. I've seen some other states that take their core stations, and they're on a conduit up the side of it. That's just asking for problems. It's too easy for a guy with a batwing to get too close, or a lawnmower to snip that cable off. So we kind of keep everything buried, you know, two to three foot deep with the conduit, and inside the, uh, in, inside the uh, concrete monument. There's our second iteration of the form. This is over at Harrison County Garage, and this one I remember real well. Everybody said, where were you at on September 11th? I was right there. That picture was taken about the time the planes were hitting the World Trade Center. Because we were on that site, getting ready to build that station, we got the phone call saying, guys, we're shutting down the state because you know, the terrorist attacks. Um, as you can see, it's, you know, we put the four inch angle iron on the sides to reinforce the corners, and we made up unistrut straps to keep the form together, keep it from blowing apart. This is the current design that we have right now. Uh, those forms, after 417 monuments, start falling apart. You know, plywood only is only good so many, so many times you know, put, take it apart, put it back together. So we want the solitude design here. We've kind of nicknamed this our Saturn V rocket. And you'll see a picture here coming up. But it's still 36 inch diameter. The first segment is 24 inch diameter, tapers to 18, and then tapers to 12. Much quicker, much easier to put together. We can actually, you know, do this in about three days in, compared to the other, <coughs> the other one that's taken us about a week to get everything done. We've kind of got everything uh, figured out and straightened around. Most of them, too, we're putting a slab around them as well, a four-inch slab. We keep it isolated from the base. That way it keeps the mowers and everything away from it. It's an operation that's an operation of us there at Freeport, pouring the concrete. We always, this Abco Concrete Company, this concrete pumping company out of Newark, Ohio, they followed us around all the sites and they took care of getting the concrete up into the monument for us. To attach the antenna to this concrete monument, we want kind of a specialized design here. Most people were saying, okay, why didn't you guys use stainless or something along that line to, you know, to actually mount the antenna to the camp, the uh, concrete monument? We looked at the uh, coefficient expansion contraction of the stainless steel. That, that was way too high for our use. We talked to the you know, National Genetic Survey. They recommended using Delrin, which is otherwise known as Nylon 66. It is a UV stabilized plastic. It has very little to no coefficient of expansion and contraction. And, you know, it actually looks pretty nice and it machines well. You know, the 5811 pin in the center there is that threads directly onto the antenna when we place it in the concrete. So, this product here has worked out really well for us. You know, there's they're running about 125 bucks, 130 bucks to have these these machines right now, and stainless steel of the same. Like I said, they'd be way too thick, and everything would just move too much, and plus be all on it. Hey Dave, you mentioned that the UV resistant. What's the is there is this 
break down over time? I mean, I know you said there, you mentioned some you gain resistance, so they don't break down over. We have not seen any issue with that. Actually, the kind of surprising side note, the antennas at Trimble, we buy from Trimble, some of the antennas have set out there after a while. Surprising, you can actually sit there and dig your fingers into the top of plastic on the, the antenna. So our, our mouth's holding up better than the Trimble antenna is. Yeah, we've not seen any issue with any of the, any of the plastic degrade, degrading on that. This is up to Marion County as well, shows us installing that. We've got a special, that's just not your normal, uh, normal level. That's, that's a very expensive, very, very tight tolerance level that we're using to set that mount in there. This, the guys from Central Office probably have recognized this, this picture. This is our core station that, that is down at Central Garage. This is, you know, the Office of Aerial Engineering used to be over on this side, but that's one of the first design on there. That's the Mini Washington Monument version, version one. <coughs> There's the, that is over at the uh, Jefferson County Garage. That is our new, new design that we're currently using. That's the, uh, what we nicknamed Saturn V. In Ross County, the, I don't know why the guys at the garage did this, but some DHTs got together and they made some decals up and they got ODOT written in letters down, down, down the side of the monument. <laughs> I should have taken a picture of it, put it in there, but I figured, well, this one here kind of shows the monument and the, and the base around it. But, yeah. I don't know if the survey crew, bring that in the survey crew down there, District 9 did it, or it was the guys at the Ross County garage that they come up with it. But it's got my, my very nice vinyl decals that say ODOT. Uh, this is our mark up South Bass Island. This, uh, this one's shorter. It's only a five foot tall monument because it's at the airport. The airport will not let us go the full eight foot because they're worried about, there's a helipad actually right over in this corner compared to where it's at. And of course the runway of the airport. They, didn't, they wanted to be able to get the wings of the planes over top of it and anything else that they would have issue. This mark is, I've been told by the guys at NGS, this mark is the most stable core station in our entire network. NGS has almost 3,000 core stations in the United States, Canada. But actually, they're expanding all over even right now. But they said that is the most stable mark they've got in their network. Why? Because this thing is embedded right in bedrock. As any of you guys know that have been up on the island, that's all rock. You know, we're only five foot, we're only six foot deep here. But what we did is we took and socketed the rebar down into the down into the bedrock, used epoxy in the rebar, and got everything set up that way, so it's it's there, it's not going anywhere. Remember the Freeport core station I was talking about? This is what happens when a county gets some money and they start resurfacing their roads, they don't know what's, what that thing is out in, out in their yard. That's supposed to be eight foot tall. What they did is they went out and did some grindings, and they just started dumping grindings around it. Well, once the District 11 survey crew has seen this and found out about it, you know, I can walk, I can walk over and sit on top of that antenna. Next day, this is what we had. <laughs> Luckily, they did not break that thing off. I cannot believe with the amount of earthwork that they were doing around and moving everything, that, that that thing did not get sheared off. So, things like this presentation, educating people what's out there, because I've had a lot of, I've, I've shown up at ODOT garages, and they call these weather stations. I said, I'm here working at a core station. They said, well, we have a weather station out here. I said, no. This is the other thing, the big white monument that's out there. So, you know, letting people know what's, you know, this program has been going on since 2000 with monuments like that. I think after 18 years, but you would turn over people. Here's another interesting one I just had to fix. This is the Van Wert Garage. Guy was in a little bit of a hurry with dump truck bed up. Hit, hit the building. We noticed, we, we actually can tell you exactly what happened because that antenna moved four centimeters. When he hit it, it actually kicked the antenna. So... I just finished, we were up just up there two weeks ago rebuilding this one after they put the new front of the building on. So <coughs> we, we can watch it, we can see it with the monitoring, the software we've got. We can see when things like this happen. Back when we started in 2000, this is what we had in each, each of the cabins. And Jerry tried, Jerry's sitting there shaking his head saying, yep, I remember these things. I've run a network to them. The, the older GPS receivers were not net networkable. So in each one of these places, that's a 36 by 36 by 12 CT cabinet. Each one of these, we have a small form factor Dell computer stuck in there to actually get, connect to pull the data off the receiver to put it on the network and send it back to the SOC. Uh, this is a Triple 5700 receiver, probably the most bulletproof GPS receiver I've ever, we've ever worked with. You can take a truck and run a truck over that thing that still work. 
Um, I saw about lightning protection. Down at the Brown County, the Brown County ODOT facility, probably 15 years ago, the uh, radio tower got struck by lightning. The of course, the system went down, the station went down. I went, out, I went down there, opened them double doors up, and almost got knocked down with the smell of burnt electronics. You know, it, it, it fried the antenna, fried the computer, fried everything in there. But when I brought the GPS server back to the office, plugged in, it started collecting satellites. So our lightning protection did its job to the point where it didn't come back through the get the receiver, plus the, the kind of says that, that receiver's pretty good. Had another one, a tower get hit up at Lima. It actually come, my grounding that I had, where everything was grounded and bonded, was actually better than the grounding in the building. Because it actually, it actually came down, hit the antenna, it followed backwards through my grounding through my lightning suppression, and actually welded the GPS receiver to the back of the metal cabinet, where it actually went to ground through that. So it's pretty interesting. I've seen so many things in the past 18 years. This is what we have currently. This is, the, this is actually an older generation receiver, but it's the same idea. Uh, that's TripleNet R5 receiver. It is networkable completely, so we just plug it into the network. It has a static IP address. The, everything's programmed right into it. You just you plug it in, logs into the network. It has its own web UI interface that you go in, you can program it, you can set the data rate and everything along that line, so we don't need the computer or anything else. This right here is a signal amplifier. Um, this one's up at the Wayne County garage, and there's over, <coughs> I think it's about 600 foot of antenna cable. So this, it's a very weak, GPS is a very weak signal to begin with. So that one here's got two signal lamps in it. It's actually bumped that GPS uh, signal up. Granted, that's a little bit of noise, but it's still it's good enough for what we've got. A lot of people questioned this. Like, you know, I've had, I, I don't think Jerry said that. I know Rusty has. Rusty complained about me putting hubs in here. No, I know. But that is not the splitting signal up. That is the cheapest surge suppressor we could find. Those little $45 five port hubs, if there's a little surge or something through the network, you get five shots. You blow, blow, blow the ports out of each one of those and just move it to the next one. So, you know, we've got, you know, this is our, this is our network surge suppressor we keep in them. It's not actually what it's designed for, but it works well. We've kind of, that's through trial and error we found out, and that's a heck of a lot cheaper than any other type of network suppressor, surge suppressor we've got that's around there. Because one hit, there's $4,500 replacing the board. And those are, the net R5s were very bad for the boards blowing out. So, you know, we've seen that issue before and we kind of learned from it. This is the Coors Light. Not the one you drink, obviously, but this is down at the uh, Pickwick County Salt Water office, um, office. It's down in Circle Bill. Um, the Coors Lights that we've built, like you said, the masonry building, the majority of our masonry, as you've seen that one of Van Works on that steel tin can, but we didn't have a better choice up there. Uh, it's a three inch schedule 40 steel pipe, five foot long. As you can see, we've used Unistrut, bolted it, braced it back into the building, bolted it back quite well. And that's how the antenna is mounted. We've actually noticed the stability on these is actually pretty good. Granted, it's not like the concrete monument that's stuck in the ground 13, 15 feet. This item right here is called a lightning candelabra. It's a lightning diffuser. Supposedly, how it works, and I knock on wood, we've not had an antenna get a direct hit yet, but that actually dissipates the static static point charge caused by that antenna. Why it's lower than the antenna, than the antenna that's NGS's rules. According to NGS, we can't have that thing, it's got, it's supposed to be 10 foot away and a foot lower, but as you can see, with the pitch of this roof, I couldn't get it 10 foot away. But that actually, as you can see, it's grounded, everything's grounded and bonded together, and this is into a driven ground, 10 foot driven ground rod, copper ground rod, Everything bonded, so it dissipates that point charge caused by the antenna. So, you know, the lightning is attracted to the point charges, so that little dissipator with all the little whiskers up there supposedly dissipates the point charge. And, like I said, we've not had anything to take a direct hit, so they must work. In 2004, after the system was up and running, you know, we had the complete network going, we've done all the testing for beta testing for Trimble. Um, we were kind of blessed. Professional Surveyor actually did a cover story on our network. We were the first state in the United States to have a statewide network. You know, I always, I always like to point out my picture's on the cover twice. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those pictures were taken out of Lancaster Bypass when they were actually building the bypass down there many moons ago. 
But yeah, professional server, they did a nice article about it, nice write-up, and like I said, it's kind of nice little kudos for our, all our work on the network. As of today, like I said, there's 61 stations, 21 of them are the course classics, uh, 30 of them are course light building mounts. That number of lights is decreasing because as you all know, ODOT's got this very aggressive policy right now about replacing county kind of garages. Well, if there's a course light at that garage, we talk with the contractor and the consultants, and actually we get them to run a conduit out for us, and we actually build course classics at all those locations. That way we're getting away from the building mounts, going more with the state and stability, because the new buildings, they're tin cans. You know, and the sheet metal building, you know, you heard me mention mold like that. It's very reflective. You know, and we have seen some issues with some of those ones that are on the metal buildings as far as positioning data, you know, you can tell, because as the satellites move, you can tell that antenna moves, but the triple software is getting better as far as modeling that movement and molded, uh, uh, mitigating the multipath, so it's not quite as critical, but we still like the concrete monument a lot better. Um, we're sharing data with the states of Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia. Um, each one of these states has their own network that's run by the DOT in each state. It knows Pennsylvania is missing. Pennsylvania defunded their core station or the core system about, it, about 10 years ago. So Pennsylvania has got two private networks over there. And with us being a state agency, you know, we can't really share data with them guys being private entities that are out there for profit. So that's why you know that little short area of the state that butts up against Pennsylvania is kind of doesn't have overlapping data. But Michigan's network. I think he's one, one roll of duct tape short of it falling apart because they, they, they've been defunded a lot in the last couple of years. Indiana, they're going along pretty well. Kentucky and West Virginia, they've both got real nice networks. Um, actually, there's 5,614 usernames and passwords have been issued since I turned this in. I've had five more people get logins. And there's earlier this spring during planning season, we had 644 people logged into this network at one time. The users are farmers and different things like that is what I'm hearing, right? Yep, farmers, surveyors, and as you see, you know, May 9th is when we hit our peak, peak planting season. They had some good dry weather. That's why you hear, don't do network shutdowns during planting season, <laughs> because 644 people logged in on that network and they're relying on it, and you know, that's, you know, why. I don't like getting nasty phone calls. I get them enough anyway. How do you register for an account? Coming up. Not, not quite yet, but it's getting close. So you register for an account. Um, we have a small, simple form. You just need to, I know Chief Legal is reviewing it right now and going back through it, coming up with something new. But uh, it's just right now, it's a simple form. It's contact information more than anything. Send me an email. I can get you an account set up and log it into the network. <coughs> not really that difficult process. But like I said, Chief Legal is reviewing it, trying to get in there, modifying it, and making sure they get all the legal speak in it. Dave, I got a question for you. Yep. When's the best time to do maintenance? Because you know we can't do any maintenance on the network during snow and ice, and then so we get out of snow and ice. And that's why you get us in the spring. Right. We're going. We're, we want to go full out. If that's a bad time for you, is it better to do maintenance at night? Yes. Then, like yep. after dark. After midnight. <laughs> I know it's not. I know you guys don't like hearing, but you know if you guys want to do the maintenance in the spring, I would say push it back as far late evening as possible, because. During the springtime, you know, those of you guys that have come through our office, see the monitors we have set up. You know, I get in the office at about 5.30 in the morning, and during spring planning season, I come in and there'd be like 150 turn people run, still running at that time in the morning. And, you know, they've been logged in for two or three days. You know, they'll log in straight, they'll start going, and they'll just switch out drivers in the cab to try to get stuff done. So, you know, summer's perfect time, or winter, but you guys, like I said, snow and ice, we can't do that. But you know, middle of summer, right now we're in a lull, right before planting or harvest season starts up again. So, you know, we're still seeing. Do they use it for harvesting? Yep. Yeah. They do. Yep. Okay. We're seeing 200 people logged in at a time right now, approximately, <coughs> on a good sunny day. Is there something we can do so that it doesn't go down when the network goes down? We reside on a separate network? You know, we've, we've got. We've, you know, if you guys are doing server maintenance, we've got a setup right now where we, we can, we've got two, you know, mirror, mirror damage servers set up where we can actually kick them back and forth and toggle them, but, you know, they're all on the same network. The reason, why, the reason I ask you is because we're going to use the, planning on using the cores for connected vehicles. 
and those will never stop. Yeah. There is a lot of testing going on with connected vehicles right now. Really? Yep. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's... This, I've got a chart that I'll show you here in a little bit that shows you how many hours and the stuff that people have used it and where the connected vehicles have come in. Right? They're just getting started. They're still actually, they're becoming pretty good type user. I just got a request yesterday from a group out of California. You know, right now, Tesla's testing in Ohio, GM's testing in Ohio, Hyundai is actually testing a automated vehicle in Ohio. I know Honda's big in it, they've always been big in it. Ford's doing some testing up along the uh, Michigan, Ohio Michigan border, because they're doing some, where they wanted to make sure that the Toledo stations up there were, were good and solid, because they're, they're mainly staying up on that area close to Detroit. Do you have a slide that explains this connectivity? I mean, why is it important for a core station? It's coming. It's coming. I can get to all the, all the, all the, I got one coming up here in a couple that actually explains how the system works and how it goes on that. I'm just going to give you the background with a little side information. But, like I said, first statewide view, statewide uh, network, 2004. We were the first state in the United States to have both GPS and GLONASS. GLONASS is the Russian satellites. We were tracking those. Ag, ag sector, they originally said it wouldn't work. Well, 2009, we proved them wrong. You know, uh, highest user in, in the world. Or, excuse me, highest user in the United States, 644. Germany's the only, com the only country that's higher than us. They've seen 1,500 logged into their network. Germany, you think no bigger Germany is. You know, they're, they're 1,500 plus, and we see 644. But with our 5,600 logins issued, we're the largest in the world that way. You know, we started it, everybody's copying us. Copy us. That's an, that is a uh, Kentucky core station. That's the Indiana design. Wisconsin. You can see they're, so far they're all been about the same. That's just kind of interesting one I've been down from down South America. The, you even have people from Japan come over and look at our network. Now they've got over 2,000, this is the core station in Japan. They've got over 2,000 stations in the country, but they use theirs mainly for seismic. They're actually watching the plate tectonics with theirs. They're not doing much of the surveying. In the U.S. military, they're using our core's light design over in Iraq and in Afghanistan. They're actually building this, these things to the sides of the uh, little mud huts and the adobe buildings out there. They're using for the GPS control over there. So we have been modeled. We're working with them as many different entities as we can. Like I said, you know, universities. We got stations at universities. OU's got one down there. Bowling Green, University of Akron, and Marshall University of Kentucky. The city, city of Dayton's bought their own, et cetera. Uh, no one's the West Union down there. The only reason they're involved is because they've kind of got the old Adams County garage now. Uh, different county engineers' offices. What is what is Dayton and some of the city using for for like navigation of? They're using it for survey crews. Oh, for survey crews. Survey crews, yep. The surveyors are kind of one of our. They're the most number of users. They're not the biggest hourly. Users. All right, how, how it works, I'm getting to this now. When you log into the network, you're using a cellular modem. The person out in the field, in the car, in the tractor, the surveyor, they've got a cellular modem connected to the GPS receiver. The GPS receiver, through the modem, sends a TGA method back to the servers at the SOC, saying, here's where I'm at. So there's the communication part right coming in right there, coming into the servers from the uh, receiver. The servers then kind of figure out where you're located at. They say, okay, he's here. You'll take the six nearest core stations to where they're located at and actually triangulate and formulate a correction stream to send back to the user. Because we've, these have all been surveyed in very precisely, so we know where they're at, but when the atmosphere changes, you know, a storm front comes through or weather changes, that changes the signal from the satellites. So as, you know, since they know where the core station's at, but the GPS signal's telling us over here, like this, it says, okay, we need a correction to bring it back to here. So when you've got the six nearest in the area, they're modeling the atmosphere over those six, six core stations. So they got you surrounded, and they kind of got a pretty good idea of where you're located at, or what, you know, weather fronts or whatever, are in your area, what multipath, et cetera. So that's how they formulate the correction stream. So you've got the communication coming in. Every second, it's on one, one hertz rate. 
So the, the receiver out in the field is sending data to the servers at one second. We're pumping data back out to them at one second rate. So it's not a very big string, but it's still, you know, it's continuous string. I know there's been problems in the past with the virus software that's, on, that's, that's been on some of the servers that's actually seen that, that little continuous stream of data going in and out, and it kind of clamps down on us. We've had some issues very early on with that. But <clears throat> that in a nutshell is how the system works as far as how it sends a GPS correction out to the users. And when these guys get logged in, you get 600 of them logged in at one time, you know, it's actually, the server's actually working pretty good kind of keeping everything modeled. Because as you move, you know, say this is guy's out here planting, as he moves five kilometers, I've got the, so I've got the, the tolerance set. As he moves five kilometers, it'll actually grab another correction. Because it could possibly change base stations, or they'll say, okay, 5K, the atmosphere's different. So it's going to tweak, it's going to continue to tweak that, that correction. That is how we can get down to sub-centimeter repeatability, you know, anywhere in the state with this network. You know, your standard GPS receiver, you know, standard on your phone or, you know, in your car, you're good to maybe 25 to 30 feet. You know, we're getting with this in with one, the one second hertz or one hertz data, we're getting down to centimeter, two centimeters at the worst, horizontally and vertical. Vertical is our weakest component, but that's just the nature of the beast, that's GPS. Vertical is always going to be the weakest because everything's coming from above you. If you had some other stuff, trying to the name from lower, you could actually refine that vertical. But right now, it's horizontal. The core stations themselves, the, you know, the, the, the rocket, as you call it, yeah. or whatever, do they, they're connected to the, they're wired to the ODOT network yes. at, at the garages, at the, at the districts, there's conduit, yep. running back to us. Yep. There, there's that, that one photo I had of the re rebar, you've seen that piece of PVC coming in. That's actually running back into the building, into that cabinet. And then in the ca in, I keep all the receiver and all that stuff in the, in the locked, typically they're locked cabinets, unless it's in behind a locked door or something like that. But you know, the receiver, which is plugged into the network, is behind that locked door and outside the locked cabinet inside the building. The only thing outside is exposed with the antenna. How much, how much radius does those monuments broadcast? How many miles? You said it talks to six, but how, how far away does it talk? Right now, we're real close to a 35 kilometer radius between the stations. We average 35 kilometers between core stations. So, you know, they don't, they don't technically talk to anything, it's just where they're pulling the data in from. You know, there's no, the stations don't talk to each other, they just talk to the SOC. They just talk to our servers down here to SOC. There's, there's a form I was about talking about earlier. There's our, you know, access to the VRS. Like I said, just a simple contact information form such as to get a login password. This is what most people are using out in the field right now to connect to our system. You know, the MiFi and the, the hotspots are the two most popular right now with surveyors, the GIS groups. The farmers are relying on this thing called a Tuacom bridge. That's basically this little network, cellular network modem. And then there are some other ones that actually have a more integrated with dual GPS and receivers and stuff like that. And that connects into the tractor somehow, those guys yeah. automatically guide it. I know those guys don't even have to drive it, they right. drive themselves. Yep. That's that's very unnerving sometimes when you're in. I, I live on a small farm down in Fairfield. I got 40 acres. The guy that farms my property was one of our initial testers for the network. He, he was using GPS before, but he always, he had a portable base station. He would actually take a base station you know, you see the tripod, like you see servers out. He'd actually set it up and he'd broadcast radio off 900 megahertz radio back to his tractor. Switched over to the cellular modem and everything. We did a lot of testing with this. And it's, it's something to be sitting there, not even see the steering wheel move, but your front wheels move, and you see the thing starts turning and the thing, thing, thing kind of guides. It's just unreal the repeatability and accuracy you're getting out of a tractor at 10 mile an hour. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a, it's an AT. Tractor. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, it is because you know they're getting less than an inch of repeatability on a 60-foot wide plant. Got a phone call a couple years ago from a guy up in uh, up close to South Pass Island. He was up on the mainland though in Ottawa County. He had one of his fields flood out, so he, he planted it initially. <coughs> he went back and replanted the areas that flooded out, and he, he called me up. He, he said, "I'm gonna show you a picture of this." He sent me a picture. It was actually the colders on his planter were rolling the old seed out. And he was planting identically in the same spot that where he planted initially. So he said, this is amazing that this is working. You know, this well and the repeatability is there. 
And right now, he had a concern that if he planted over top of some seeds, that he might get two in the same pole or two really close to each other and it would mess with his crop and his yield and all that stuff. He wasn't, he wasn't worried about that as much. Okay. He just he just was, he just used the same baselines and then planted, replanted. So the precision was just incredible to him. Yeah, and the big push right now, of course, is the nitrogen runoff for the algae blooms. Uh, a lot of guys up in that area are doing what they call strip till. They're actually going in in the fall, injecting nitrogen in the ground, and in the spring, they want to come back and want to plant right on top of that nitrogen. That way they're saving nitrogen. They don't have the runoff from the nitrogen running off. You know, them spread broadcasting fertilizer, you know, rains washes into the Maumee River, ends up in the lake. So now they're injecting the nitrogen in the ground, they're coming in and planting. So, you know, they're saving the cost of the fertilizer. They're saving the diesel fuel. So that's why the ag guys have really taken us around with that. You know, it's, it's just unreal what they're doing with it. And, and the environment is it too. Yeah. And there are manufacturers right now that actually have autonomous tractors out there. I've seen one in action. I'll show you a picture here coming, coming up again. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, when we first started, we did a lot of testing with the ag groups. This is actually, this, this is actually my farmer. This is at his place. We're working on getting his tractor set up. But you know, we went out and tested repeatability over, over a couple different you know, time frames a day, you know, a couple days. And you can see you know, the precision. And granted, it wasn't high tech. We had a paint, paint, uh, spray, paint, you know, bleh, spray paint can put on a three point hitch tractor, and we just kind of run it over and over again. Um, to access the system, you know, everybody, everybody's got to have a unique login and password. You can't use the same password for two, two people. Um, we're broadcasting different multiple data formats. Everything is based on NGS's uh, 2011 coordinates, currently current coordinates. And everything's calculated by the VRS, or by NGS, excuse me. This is how much, since when the Ag Group hit us in 2009, that's when everything started take, kind of taking off anyway. You can see we've got a pretty steady state. Those are the number of logins from 2009 to 17. This kind of shows our system, the usernames, based on classifications. You know, you see survey, the survey company is still the largest, but ag guys, not too far behind. Utilities, government's right in there, construction education. Based on the, based on the usage for every classification. This jump you see here was caused by the oil and gas industry. When they found oil over in eastern Ohio, and started doing all that, you know, the survey crews would come into Ohio like crazy. And that's why the big jump was. And you can actually see it's dropped off a good bit now since the oil price has kind of dropped. The ag guys have kind of been a steady state shooting up and they're by our users, largest user by far. The construction, is that like when you see guys on the side of the highway with the tractors and they got the little yep. radar units, is that using our course? It's using GPS. Okay. Not necessarily always our units. Um, that's kind of starting. They're starting to use bus more. The, they were in the same boat the ag groups were in. Because Ag said it wouldn't work, wouldn't work because the one second rate wasn't enough. Well, Shelley and Sands is doing a pilot project right now using old VRS. They're starting from the get go, starting from design to build using VRS because, like I said, they were saying the one second rate wasn't enough because. Are they using on the 70 months out project, you know? Yeah. Just south of the Columbus area. Yeah, I didn't see them with any of the tripods out, but yet all the tractors and they were, you know, they were, or not tractors. Dozers. But, Dozers were pushing dirt and stuff, and it's like there's no tripods around, so yeah. they have to be getting that signal from somewhere. They're coming off the cell modems and doing that. They're even doing paving right now with VRS. They've got a special paver, Shelly bought a paver unit that's got, the, they loaded some machine control stuff on it. They're actually doing the pavement, that new smooth pave that they're working with, I think is what they're calling it. They're actually using the, using the system for that. Uh, yeah, they, they used to use the one on, like you said, a base portal base station on the side of the road, and that, they were broadcasting at 20 to 50 hertz. So everybody thought they needed that 20 times a second or 50 times a second to make sure the blade moves enough. You know, come on, we're moving. We're not building more Swiss watches. Right. But, you know. A lot of times they'll still install their base stations on ITS infrastructure as well. Yeah. But they'll contact us and say, hey, can we put this on your cabinet or on your pole? Yep. They're using that as a fallback or backup. I know Kokosing, Kokosing hasn't really adopted it. They're using it for the survey. They're not using for machine control yet. So the Kokosing ones, you'll see there it's on bridges or, like I said, the ITS cabinets. I've seen them out there. This is the one I'm talking about as far as the uh, breakdown. So out of all the, last year, we had 519,000 hours of usage with the system as far as the number of logins, times that. 
ag users are 41%. Utilities, this is the oil and gas industry. They're out there locating their utilities and locating all the underground pipes and everything for the new gas lines, transmission lines. Autonomous vehicles just got started, and you know, they're, they're 3%. Last year, I think it was the first year that we really had any autonomous vehicles testing on the system, but you know, they're currently at 3%. They're doing using it more than the, like ADP is. ADP is at 50 log in, they only use in the, like, they use 1%. Surveying 24 and construction, they're going to be growing here next couple years too as more people use the uh, uh, automatic machine control. You know, we're we're always running the system. You know, we're maintaining them the best we can. Yes, the ODOT phone is with me on the holidays and weekends, so whenever that's kind of the VRS hotline, people can call and scream at me when it goes down. That's usually when you guys get a phone call. <laughs> Kevin Hartman's got enough phone calls from me in oh, off hours <laughs> in the past. He, he can take a vouch for that. <laughs> There's the, the maintenance truck right now. Everything's on there that we can use to fix it. Uh, as far as managing the system, you know, it's daily monitoring. You guys come down to the office, you'll see the monitoring system set up. We got the, finally got the website up and, up and running. You know, Simon got it through all the testing, all the vulnerability testing. And our website's now live in the network. We always, always are working with NGS. You know, we, hand in hand with them guys, they're the ones that validate the system, they, you know, they store warehouse of data for us. Software, Tremble is always coming up with new off software upgrades, we got a new one coming, but I don't know when we're going to install it. Obviously not harvesting, probably do it in the winter time. Hardware, we're always, as long as budget required, a budget, we have budget, we request the receiver's name hands. Some of the applications, you know, we've got GPS surveying, uh, project control, you know, these, all the survey crews in ODOT are equipped with the same essential setup as far as going out and being able to use our system. <clears throat> you know, the GIS groups are using it for locating signs, doing sign inventories, culvert management. Like I said, precision ag is the biggie as far as hours. There's a picture of the autonomous tractor cases, cases got right now. I saw that tractor in operation. That's our show tractor, that picture. The one I saw up in Racine. Side note, I collect case, old case farm equipment, so that's why I'm kind of partial to the red stuff. The green stuff does not work on our network unless it's using a Trimble or an off-brand receiver. John Deere, Green Star receivers will, do not accept the data stream that we have. John Deere's proprietary. Mall Deere is that way. You know, John Deere, you gotta be John Deere. So that's why, you know, the farmers that are using our system out there, they're either running case or another brand they're not running deer unless they're checking out a different receiver. What's John Deere using then? Just the satellite segment? Using satellites, and they've got a radio network. A lot of their dealers set up around the state have a 900 megahertz radio broadcasting. So they've got uh, a tower with maintain on it. They're pushing out 900 megahertz radio frequency. <coughs> and the guys are logging in using the radios, not using sites. <coughs> when we first started hitting the ag, the ag uh, sector, JD Equipment in Lancaster, actually sent out a letter to their users saying how we it wouldn't work, we didn't man it, it was turned off at night, um, you know, the repeatability accuracy was not there. My farmer who runs John Deere, you seen, but he runs Trimble GPS in it. He re-brought this to me and he said, Dave, here's the BS that you know, John Deere's putting out about your network. He said, I know it's not right. Because he said, this is what you guys are working against. You know, John Deere is huge. You know, John Deere is a marketing genius. But, you know, I, I enjoy going to the Farm and Science Review and walking into the, the John Deere tent and start teasing the people that are in there. <laughs> Will you guys ever work with the ODOT? The ODOT's got this network. You know, you guys ever work with that? I had one girl flustered so bad one year. She said, sir, I, I, I gave her my card. I said, if you have any questions, here. I'm the manager for <laughs> my support network. She said, sir, sir, I, I just do what I told. I said, just do what I told. This, this is how they trained me. I said, I know. It's fine, you know. <laughs> because all radio networks don't work. and. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of fun messing with doing that. I get that coming up here in about, in about two weeks, the farm science review again. But yeah, I've been like I said, I seen the autonomous case up there in Racine work uh, last year. Yeah, it was the 175th anniversary of case. They had a big thing up there, and I went up for the thing and the, for the whatever it's celebration, their head convention. I bet you that ain't cheap. No. <laughs> the one they had, this whole fiberglass frame was busted up. You know, it was scratched up. They obviously run into some stuff when they were doing their autonomous testing, but to watch it out in the field, 
And, you know, there's no cab on it. There's no way a person drive that thing. Right. You know, it just went out and, you know, they set up their set up their AV line, which is their baseline. They set up the offset for the plows and corrections. Disc was on the back of it. The thing would run down the field, turn around, come back. It just kind of working back and forth all on its own. It was not remote control either. You could just, you could tell the GPS was handled and they were using the, with the WIS cores, Wisconsin cores network. So if you, you ever see, you drive, you drive by, drive it up and down 71 or whatever, and you see guys running like this with their markers up, you know they're on a GPS and they're on our network typically. Because those, mar those markers, they pull the markers out and they use that as a site. That's how they lined up in the past. You know, they drop the markers, they line it up at the center of their uh, steering wheel or center of the hood, and that's how they kept their line straight. Well, now they just sit back and read a book, you know, or eat their lunch when they're, when they're on the equipment. Or in five or ten years, you're going to see things like this with no cab out there running with their LiDAR unit on the front and GPS everywhere else. And like I mentioned before, these guys, the construction companies are going with the GPS. Those are the two Trimble units that were on that cat. This is kind of a fun project we did. That's John Ray sitting there in the, in the dozer seat. We actually took a piece of property out behind the Franklin County Engineer's office down here. We had our, we flew it with our LIDAR. We had our mapping team map it. We had a design, a ditch. We had, had it uploaded into the machine and we actually did it. So we proved we went out and proved that actually using VRS from start to finish would work. <coughs> that was a ball playing with the bulldozer. You know, we got to, for a week, we're out there with a bulldozer just doing this work, just to testing to make sure the system would actually do what we said it would do to improve it. So, you know, the construction guys, like I said, have been slow to adopt it, but they're coming on. As, as soon as Shelly Officer gets his pilot project done, you know, it's, they're going to take off too, they're crazy. I've certainly heard, you know, the software we're running is called Trimble Pivot Platform. Now, typical for engineering firms, they got acronyms, and it's an acronym within an acronym, basically. Pivot stands for the Progressive Infrastructure View Overlay Technology, and then an acronym for that. Our acronym for that is TPP. What this is, that's just their big, Trimble's got their big software platform that they're using, they're pushing right now, called Pivot. Um, within that, we can actually do a lot of add-ons. It's not only just the GPS corrections. You know, we can actually put atmospheric models, atmospheric sensors at each one of our core stations and use it for weather forecasting. There's some, there's actually a weather forecasting lab in um, Boulder that have taken data, not from us, but have taken data from surrounding states that got ATMO sensors that they're sent out there. Out there. Uh, seismic, you know, seismic sensors at each one of these stations. One kind of neat thing, you remember the big um, earthquake that hit Japan here a number of years ago that, that uh, took out the nuclear plant? NGS gave our data to the uh, earthquake center for our four stations to actually see if that earthquake affected Clear River in Ohio. They, they called me up and said, hey, is it okay if we send a bunch of a block of your data to the guys over in uh, Washington State so they could actually test the um, seismic to see if you guys, your data was affected? I didn't hear anything. I don't think we would. We probably felt a little bit, but nothing that we ever noticed, and not the core stations even noticed. So, you know, that is a big umbrella. That software is a big umbrella of all the different uh, softwares that they have. We're all running, you know, with the pivot software upgrade, you know, Mike can justify that. We, you know, we went with all the virtual servers. We had the big project where we went with all VMs. Uh, you know, we got a re full redundant system right now. We got two sets of server or two servers set up. You know, you're utilizing, accessing one uh, database. You know, we've got the website up and running finally. Trimble's got some mobile apps out there that I, I could actually run the system from my phone, but they don't work. Trimble's been promising they would work for the last couple of years, and they haven't. And, you know, they get different data formats. There's what we see back at the office. These are all the stations, and you can see that we can actually know, actually I said when you know when one's down. At that point right there, Dark County was down. Well, the Dark County station was down for that when that picture was taken. That was back when they were building a new station, a new system, the new garage. So the network was cut for that. But, you know, this is what we see back back in here. We can actually see when people are logged in. As you can see, District 11 was logged in at that time right there. Big Brother is watching you because I can actually zoom in. We can zoom in tight enough, and you can actually see the people moving across the field or moving around with the GPS. Kind of funny note: my son worked for a surveying firm 
my son's a senior in high school. He worked for a survey firm this summer, and I knew what his login was. When he was out in the system, I could kick him off. <laughs> he got, he got, he got there work, and I just right mouse click, delete. Boom! They knocked him off the network. He knew Dad was messing with him. About, about the third time, I kicked him off. So I left him alone the rest of the day. That was his last day of work, and I figured, you know what? I'm having a little fun with John. He was up working north of Columbus, up by, uh, up in Delaware County with uh, the guys. And I sat there, and I see him like, oh, it's too easy. Uh, this is the current. This is the website we got set up right now. Um, finally, got this live. Like I said, Simon got everything through and got it through, and it's. You could actually get a username and password going through this website, but we've got that ac accessibility turned off because we like to control a little bit better you know, who gets the logins and passwords. Kind of like the, I, you know, it's way I keep them graphs current with the, you know, the user, their ag or survey or whatever. I kind of modify their usernames so I can sit back and look at it and, and sort it out. So that's why we just use our own uh, form to get the logins. Is there a cost nope. for the user? It was, we've kicked around the idea multiple times of charging for it, charging for use, but since this thing was built using federal money, state money, technically, you know, we can't really charge for it. And the, one of the worst thing about it was any money we make off of it has to be kicked back into the general fund and can't be funneled back into maintenance of the system. You know, Rachel, our office manager, current office manager, she said if we ever got pushed, pushed on the shove, she's gonna try to get some of that money earmarked so that if we did charge, it would go back because, you know, the surveyors and farmers that are paying for this, they don't want the money to go back back into the system to fix a pothole and clear across the state. They want to be able to maintain the network they're paying for. So that's the one thing that we're, that's the one thing that's kind of holding us up as far as doing any charging. And that's been our big argument. I said, well, if you guys are going to make us charge for it, then we want the money in our budget. And <coughs> they haven't, uh, that hasn't come through yet. There's the apps I was talking about. Neither one of them currently works correctly on an Apple. The Android phones, it does work somewhat. The benefits that the outside users are seeing from using this, just, you know, I was talking about the fertilizer runoff and diesel fuel. Based on an average farm size in Ohio, 2,000 acres, which this was, this number, these numbers were put together by one of the precision ag groups here in Ohio. They're seeing, on average, $20,000 of cost savings per year using the VRS network based over not using any guidance at all. You know, that's as far as using the markers, like I said. Not using, you know, their own GPS, but using GPS and the cores in particular, they're seeing a $20,000 savings per year. You know, they're seeing the sub, the sub accuracy repeatability in real time, which is real time. You know, the, the steering and the auto road shutoffs and whatnot. Uh, reduced fatigue, of course, the auto steer. Reduced fuel. In the years past, you could never plan at 10 mile an hour. These guys are planting the 10 mile an hour harvesting. It's the capacity of the machines is getting so much larger that they can run faster. You know, I can't believe watching <coughs> my farmer go across the field 10 mile an hour planting. When, I, when that's that's travel, that's highway travel speed for my, my older equipment. You know, so he's run, you know, he's planting at that speed. And he's covering a swath 50 feet wide with his planter. So he's got this big four wheel drive John Deere that's after hauling across the field, dust clouds behind him, and just me driving back to my barn, he's passing. You know, he's actually getting getting work done covering a distance. You know, you were talking about, you know, the end row control as far as, you know, when they come into a, a triangular shaped field, if they're 50 feet wide, they get down there and start getting into the corner, they were over planting. You know, back in the day, they were over planting because they couldn't shut off. Well, now they've got the planters set up where they can shut off individual rows. So as they come into that triangle, they're not over planting and not stealing the nitrogen and the fertilizer from the other plants. You know, it's, it's, when the plants are just starting to come up, you can look out in the field, you can tell if the guy's been using, the, using this technology because it's beautiful. You don't see the runover, you don't see the everything. Everything's kind of nice and square and neat. And it, it's unreal. Uh, the nitrogen runoff and the waste of materials. And um, one thing now they're, I notice they're doing is they're mapping field tile. That way they know where all their drainage is at. So they're out mapping everything and they're tying it back to a permanent reference point. You know, our cores network is on the current data. It's not moving until 2022 when they shift everything, but that, they'll still be have the software able to shift it, but they know where everything's at and they're gonna stay on where it's at. Whereas if we're using a base station, a portable base station, whenever they move that base station, unless they've got a monument, that coordinate base coordinate moves. So, you know, 
turn everything down. You know, the surveyors are do the same basic things. You know, they're asset utilization, they're getting the guys out in the field. As much as I hate to see it, one man survey crews are becoming a normal thing. You know, you get one guy out there, he can do as much work as a four man crew could in the past with the GPS and the VRS. Like I said, no more babysitting a base station. What happens when the network goes down? The network goes down or a server dies, shuts off, that stops that correction stream. The newer equipment in the ag, in the ag, because they're, the they're the biggest screamers. That's why I, you know, I talk about the ag group the most. They're, they're, they, they can them the most. The newer equipment, they've got it set up where they can, their equipment actually holds that correction in its head, in its brain, basically, for 10, up to 10 minutes, unless they move far enough away. So it's saying, okay, this correction is good for about the next 10 minutes. So they can continue running for 10 minutes. So they're fine for 10 minutes. If it's just a short shutdown, they're, the guys with newer equipment is fine. Um, once that time elapses, they punch the clutch in, they're done. Because a lot of the newer equipment, the, the bigger equipment, the big farm equipment doesn't have markers on it because it was designed for GPS. So they can't operate without GPS. Um, surveyors out there, the autonomous vehicles, unless they've got something set up like the ag guys, uh, with the old equipment, they're dead in the water immediately. As soon as that correction stream stops, they're done. You know, their, their system goes into flow, the accuracy <coughs> goes out the window, they're back to 30 foot, 20, 30 foot repeatability, they're done. That's when the phone starts ringing. Um, like, okay, 10 to 12 feet is what I got in there for their autonomous. Some receivers are better than others. Then my, then, my, then my phone rings. They, you know, when they, they, I've had, I don't need alarms set up on these servers, even though we do, because I've got the ag users that start calling me, you know, within a couple minutes. You know, when the system goes down. A couple years back, this was actually right when we started to switch over to Pivot, the system server crashed. Luckily, it was at the end of the day, it was towards 4 or 5 o'clock, Kevin was in his office when this happened, but the system went down, the server crashed. It wasn't a network issue, but the server crashed. I had 80 phone calls within 20 minutes of guys chewing me, chewing me out, wanting to know why the system was down, and it was the worst. They think of something we did. Well, it was just it was an issue with the virus, the virus software. I think what caused it to crash. At that point, that's when Kevin forced we forced it over to the new servers. Because I remember I told Kevin, I said, we're gonna be a hero or zero, Kevin. I says, he said, Do you want to use the new servers? The test servers? I said, go for it. Because we could he tried everything. You know, he on that one server that was causing the issue. But yeah, we you mentioned there's um, some overlap, and that's what I was asking earlier on the radius of the broadcast. Yeah. But if you have one site you're down, there's still five other sensors or, or instruments. Actually, it'll go out to the next one out. It always uses six. So you could have one or two down in the state, yes. and it's not mission critical. Right. We've got right now, um, there are two stations down in, down in the state right now. One's at Fulton County Garage, and we're still running fine. The Fulton County Garage and uh, Van Wert. Like I said, Van Wert were burning it in, getting the opposition to create grip. But yeah, once you open it up further, you know it likes keeping those six nearest. But if one, if say the closest one drops down, it'll just go to the next one out. Once the, everything opens up, the accuracy will degrade a little bit because it likes that tight 35 kilometer radius of the receivers. But the way the system works, you know, we could have. Probably three or four down, and still get decent repeat repeatability from everything working. So having one having one location die, you know, battery backup dies, you know, network cable gets cut, whatever, receiver gets smoked, you know, it's not critical there. The big the big problems happen when the network goes down and the whole thing drops, because, like I said, we're relying on that 100 percent, and still the weak point cellular. You know, the guy out in the field with his cellular modem. You know, he gets into an area there where the cellular data is the cellular data is tough. You know, it's not real good. They, they have issues. They have to maintain a login authentication the whole time the tractor. Yes. Running. Uh, I just assume it authenticated that equipment to this GPS stuff. Because you've got that continual talking back and forth. The receiver updating where it's at. You know, the, the GGA stream is coming out of the GPS in the you know the rover out the field, the tractor, the server, or whatever. That has to stay. Stay connected. And then some of the GPS units actually download the entire map so that when you go through an area that doesn't have cell service, like in your for navigation, mm -hmm. it downloads a, a 
map so that it gets continu give you continuous service. Is there any talk about that in the farm world? That's basically what they're doing with their RTK Extend, is what they're calling it, where they can run for 10 minutes okay. after your connection drops. Okay. Yeah, that's that's coming. That's you know a lot of the, the newer equipment has that. So that kind of helps them out in you know on fence roads or areas even where they their GPS is compromised. If they get up on a tree line and they lose five or six satellites, you know they can still keep on the straight and narrow with, with their, their equipment. That's it. Uh, there's our office information. There's the uh, website, web address. There's our email address with the course group, and we have an FTP site where we store all of our all of our uh, static data for the, all the all the connections for all the uh, surveyors. You can see, you know, Rachel's our our uh, administrator. Ray Boost, survey manager, then me, and then Colton Wilson. He's the IT that's kind of um, he's helping me out with all the core stuff right now, kind of getting him trained because. They say we'll bite or dies that we need somebody to watch this system. Since I've been, since I've been doing this for 20 years, they're waiting on me to drop over dead, I guess. <laughs> they don't want you stepping in front of a bus, right? Right, especially on homeless one. Yeah, let's run it off course. That would be classic, wouldn't it? <laughs> Get killed by the <laughs> network. All right, any other questions there, guys? Yes, ma'am. So, um, you had indicated Germany has the 1500. Um, do we have unlimited um, concurrent licensing? So it can grow easily. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have. Trimble is very good at nickel diming us. So you know, we buy licensing in blocks. So we've got we got a, I think we're, we've got twelve hundred right now with what we've got. Yeah. But you know, if we get much much over that, then we've got another payment to open up another open up another block of access. Um, and the software, I'm thinking why they're so big over in Germany is that software is designed, and written, it was all written in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's where Trimble, that's where their Trimble software center is at over there in Germany. So they're probably doing a lot of testing and a lot of that's fine too, doing stress testing. They don't have John Deere. They don't have John Deere, yeah. <laughs> they're probably running the Panthers. <laughs> Panthers <laughs> on the you mentioned autonomous vehicles. Yep. Drive Ohio. Are they actually thinking about using the Corps network for <clears throat> navigation? Well, it's not just the autonomous vehicles, all the connected vehicles as well. So all the map messages that you sent out, like you're driving down the road and you want to you want to know which lane you're in. So that like you're driving up to a signal, you want to know if the right turn signal is or left turn signal is green. You know, it can tell you that information, and that can help you through the signal or through the roundabout. Um, so yeah, but we've basically learned looking at the RTTM though, just a real time correction. Yeah. You know, that's one of our primary outputs, the RTCM30. The thing is, I, I was kind of, I'm kind of questioning that. Do they need centimeter for the car? That's what I, that was you don't want 30 feet if you're trying to. No, don't want 30 feet. But you know, there is WAS. You know, WAS will get you down within a foot or two. But still, that's a foot or two. That's a fender. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's the thing. We always kind of sit back and say, look, well, guys, the autonomous vehicle. I understand it with testing, but in the in the future, will they need that good of accuracy with all the sensors? Yeah, that's, another, that's, I mean, that's another question. Yeah, because I know I just I just bought a newer vehicle. It's got all the sensors. It drives me nuts. Right. And you know the, the proximity sensors and everything on that car. You know it's amazing what they've got. I'd love to turn the thing that's off. Supposedly you're supposed to be able to. Yeah. I haven't got features off. Yeah. Well, I haven't you go to the driver and it's going off. Yeah, I tried to back out of the garage and things in there beeping at me. Yes, I know the door's there. You know the crash. The the, the one that bugs me the most is if the front of the car gets a little dirty. It's got that collision thing. I got a heads-up display. It's a Chevy SS. I got the heads-up display. That thing pops up big, bright red collision. I'm not hitting anything. It's just bugs or something on the sensors that are causing that to go off. It's like, damn it, you know. <laughs> you know especially at five, 5 o'clock in the morning, driving into the office, and the stupid thing goes off. I got the collision. Like, what car is that? So, yeah. How many concurrent users can be on the system? As far, like I said, we don't know. We, we, we're licensed up to 1,200. Um, as far as the capacity of the servers, I don't know. When we had when we hit 644 this spring, I checked. I looked at the monitors on it. We were only running up like 30 percent, 30 to 35 percent CPU, and like 40 percent on the RAM. So the servers we got right now, the two virtuals that we got sitting there running, they got plenty of capacity. So 
I think our limit right now is our licensing. You work for 1200 because, you know, with the VM servers, it's real easy to throw RAM at them or throw processors and stuff at them. So those, that, uh, those load balance through the load balance? Yes. So all you have to do is spin up another server, which is pretty easy, and to add capacity behind the virtual IP. Right. It's all one IP address, right. multiple servers on the back end. So. Yeah, I've got it. Like I said, we've got it. Right now, to the con two concurrent units, I've got them load balanced, but we could ship everybody over to one if we had to. So if one car autonomous vehicle is connected, that's, that's considered as one user? Yes. That's one of the limitations of the terminal software. You know, one login, one user. You know, I know I had a, there, there was a guy yesterday that was getting autonomous users. He asked how many he could log in with that one. I said, just the one. So he, he told me he'd email me back with the whole list. I don't know how many testing he's going to do. So do you have a lot of autonomous vehicles moving around? Like, once they start testing, then um, 200 pounds would be a small amount. Right. Uh, it'd be interesting to see. <laughs> It's going to be scary to see. I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping in 12 years after I retire is when it, when it hits, hits me. Because <laughs> I, I, that, yeah, you know, that, that map that you saw, the map that I showed you with the, all the baselines and stuff on it, that would just be covered with users. Because at 644, I could actually see, you can see where the bread baskets of the state are at during peak season. You know where the farming is going on. Because it's just one big cluster. You can almost look like you can walk between tractor and tractor, you know, on systems that are logged in. <coughs> so, yeah, with connected vehicles and that stuff, that, that's, going to be interesting. If each connected vehicle, like, you know, if things go as people think they're going to go with every vehicle being a connected vehicle in the next five to eight, six, eight years, whatever the case may be, there would have to be a serious overhaul of the whole system. Yes. Right? Network, servers, everything. Yep. You know? Well, in my understanding, the connected vehicles wouldn't necessarily receive the information. They would get it from a site. Server somewhere you or just have a broadcasting. You'd have to have, okay, kind of like what the uh, Niner Records radio is doing, but right. it's a cellular exactly. type. But it'd be broadcasting to RTTM. Okay. Okay, that'd be a lot. Then that way, you could have one login serving 500 cars. Right. So that would make more sense than you, have, you know, everybody, because once the car passed the sensor, you know, it would pick up that, that correction stream. Right. Instead of them logging in and saying, here, this is where I'm at. And every five kilometers, here's where I'm at, here's where I'm at, you know. Updating. It's still you wouldn't want system to go down. No. It's got more hair than I've got. Communication flow would want to set up between the IPS AV network and the Toyota. How much does it cost to build one monument like that? Not counting the GPS receiver, about four grand. Forty grand? Four thousand dollars. And how much is the receiver? Right now we're getting up to 10, 10 or twelve thousand. But they were forty. They were forty. And you said they're a lot better now. And they're better. How is that happening? Technology. <laughs> you could outsource the building of the monuments and they could charge forty thousand, right? Yes. <laughs> they probably would. Which is what they would do. <laughs> Which is what they would do, right. yes. How long does it take to construct this one? Three days. Yeah, the big thing is waiting on Rusty to get the network network cables, <laughs> and then he, then get them punched out where they actually connect. <laughs> right, Jerry? <laughs> Jerry has to go out and fix it for him. Yeah. <laughs> so you got Kashaka County to do yet? Yep. I I talked to him. I went out and scoped it out, and the consultant, the contractor, did a great job there. They got the condo around it. I said this is going to be easy. So once Kashokton gets turned over, completely over to five there, yep. we're gonna head up that direction. Uh, September 17th we're moving in. Okay. So late September we'll be there. Greg, Greg and Jerry has a network running, so we have live network. Yeah. I can get my cabinet in there, then that way they can get everything in for me before I build it. But usually after we build it, we let the thing set for about a month or two, let the concrete cure, let all the movement that's gonna happen, then we'll throw an antenna in there. 